This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Levijou. Welcome to episode 30 of the podcast. Uh, we go back to a little bit of the interview from Jan de Brandt where he talks about the roles of the coach, uh, and we thought it was an appropriate thing to cycle back around to. Uh, it's been, I think, a bit over a year since we did Jan's interview, and he had definitely had some interesting things to say from his perspective. And his kind of idea of the three different um, roles that the coach takes on is, is something worth thinking about. So uh, give a listen to what Jan has to say, and then you can uh, hit, see if you agree with our take on it. And, you know, hey, if you've got your own ideas, feel free to let us know. Send us an email, tweet about it, post about it on Facebook, you name it. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Till then, enjoy. If we talk specifically about uh, about training, um, how how has your training um, methodology changed over over time. Maybe uh, how how a training session is different or the same as um, when you began coaching to to now. Well, I can say to you, and I'm really proud of this, that I never gave the same training in my life. The concept was there, but. I always change something, something in the exercises, um, something in the order of organization. What is really important for me, and that developed, I developed by all the years, is the organization of the training. I don't like that players have to wait. Mm -hmm. For example, in the row of attack, I always try to find an organization where nobody is waiting longer than 5 to 10 seconds, not more. It's impossible. So that means that my trainings are more intense. And this is why I like also. It's about intensity. Um, I prefer to train one hour and a half with good intensity, with a good focus, with a good physical charge than to make really long trainings. It depends, of course, of the group you have, because I'm also training long time with youth players when you have to develop techniques. But also there, I think you can find a way to reduce the time of practice, but to give always higher quality. I like that the player, when he's using or when he's learning technique, he's executing five times, but very good. Then to repeat 100 times, and 50 are bad. Yep. So um, I think you have to give them really well the image from the first time. Yep. It's like this I want. And you are only going to do like this. And there you develop, like um, in the practice, I say always, the first 45 minutes of practice, I'm going to be a dictator. Sorry for the word, but you have to do the things like I want that you do the things. Because I'm convinced that this technique can be good for you. And there are a lot of ways to, to learn a technique. But when I see you now with your physical abilities, your posture, I think this technique is the best for you. Mm -hmm. So please, do it always. When you do just pepper, put your feet right, open well in the shoulder. Those are small details, but you do this every time. And then you are going to develop a good technique. If you one time you put your right foot in front or you are attacking just with the elbow or whatever, oh, it's fun, but you are never going to learn the good technique. So um, that's what I want to say. Um, I prefer to give them the right image and a good image from the beginning. Then you don't have to train so much. I prefer to train, for example, three times one hour a day or two times, one hour and 45 minutes, 
but always at a very high quality. And uh, only, I know also, only perfect practice makes you, makes a perfect play. Mm -hmm. So why don't you do that from the beginning? I am a setter and it's maybe one of my biggest points when I start with the team and I look them how they are setting and I am vomiting. Okay. I am vomiting because they cannot set a ball. And then I explain them, okay, this is my technique, but I know I was a setter for so many years, I know it's a good technique. The balls will not slip through your hands if you do this. And please, it tell you, it's so important in this tie-break system that everybody after a defense is responsible for setting. And this will make the difference between a good team and an average team is yeah. that everybody can set the ball very well. Yes. High ball to the spots, high spots on the net or to the back row, the pipe, but it's a quality set. So I teach them to set. And this was from the youth, because I coached all my life through, I coached the youth, mm -hmm. to the top level, the highest level. When I was coaching um, Gamova, also in Fenerbahce, mm -hmm. come on, but the Russians, they know how to set. Yeah. The Russians have those techniques. I didn't have to correct her a lot, but there were other players, like star players, yeah. who can even set a ball. So I started with that all the time. So please pay attention to it. It's crucial. I'm going to be a dictator on you in the first part. In the second part, I am the training, I am more a creator. I am going to invent exercises where I can develop the creativity of a player. And I like, for example, a lot of open exercises mm -hmm. who are not always related directly in a three contact game. Okay, we can put five contacts or six contacts and then we can take or develop a player on the technical side because he has more time to prepare his, uh, his action mm -hmm. and we develop also on the technical side because we have a little bit more time to analyze and afterwards you go back to the normal three contact game and there okay i like to see how my players are dealing with the exercise and I have to admit that there is a difference between women and men volleyball. Mm -hmm. Men are, and I excuse me, but it's my experience, men are more creative in that sense. Women, I have to teach more. And after they can become creative, after a long time, they start to feel this exercise. Oh, I can do this. Oh, I can do that. Men from the start are experienced experiencing a lot of different movements and say, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? And they are starting with it. Yeah. So in that part, I like to see how they are creating the exercise. And afterwards, it's a time of play or 6-6 six, six or 4-4 four, four, and like this. And I am more the observator. I look, I look uh, what they are doing with the goal of practice during the game situation. If they have to learn a very sharp cross court, yep. when are they starting to do this in a game situation? And I remember one story I always told. I was playing a lot of times with Emil Rousseau, who was the actual coach of Knack Ruslar. Yep. Uh, and we were fanatics of training. And uh, okay, Emil wanted to hit the sharp diagonal from position four and out of the shoulder and shutting. Well, he's, I saw him doing this in the game after six months. Yep. Six months we were practicing it and suddenly, bam, he did it in the game also. And there, okay, he became more and more self-confident in himself to use this shot and that shot and to make a lot of variation. 
So those are the three, I think, the three roles I am always playing during practice. Dictator, creator, observator. One of the most interesting discussions that you can have with, with coaching about coaching is the is idea of what are the roles of the coach. And there are so many things that, that happen in, in sport and coaching that you... Um, uh, uh, the just the 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 area of res, areas of responsibility are so wide, so it it can be a really interesting uh, interesting question. And and uh, Jan has come up with with three particular roles that I thought were interesting and were uh, you know the starting point for for a conversation. And and uh, he talked about the three main ones here as being. Uh, dictator, the creator, and observer, and uh, oh, I think it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting conversation. Particularly, oh no, actually, all three of them. Yeah, well, true, and certain coaches probably take one of those much more seriously than others. We get <laughs> we can think of. Um, uh, I mean, yes. like the tradition of, a, of an American football coach is probably much more toward dictator, at least in terms of outward impression, whether it, you know, it's probably different internally, but from what it looks like, um, much more dictator. Yeah, and, and uh, Jan talks about it, though, as being at different times. So you're not a dictator at, at all times um, or, or any of those three things, but... There are some specific times where what you, what the coach says goes, and um, and I think the game is uh, is often one of those things where the the time allowed for communication is uh, uh, is very short, and yes. the the opportunity to to listen and respond and and have a lot of voices is uh, is much diminished in that in that time frame. Right. Yeah, in our sport, where we don't have the ability to call the play every single play mm -hmm. um, or every touch of the ball, the dictator thing probably takes a little bit of a backseat during, at least during match time. You know, what people do in practice is a little bit different. Uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, coaches have to become much more observers um, during game play, perhaps than some of them would really like, but such is the nature of our sport. Uh, which, and I think in terms of dealing with players, obviously all of these have different different aspects to the, the overall sense of coaching. But it strikes me that as a coach, dealing with the players directly in terms of their own individual development, the mm -hmm. observer probably takes the, takes the highest level of, of, uh, of attention because you're the, you're supposed to be the objective, exterior you know voice thing yeah you know, trying to trying to link up what they're actually doing with what they think they're doing and get the you know get the two on the same page um i know i was reading something actually that i think i blogged about a while back about you know how creative you need to be as a coach because so much of what we do is basically problem solving you know we, mm -hmm. do, we do the observation of the team to, uh, to identify priorities, developmental needs, that sort of thing. But then the creativity part of it is, well, how do we get from where we are at point A to where we want to be at point B using whatever tools we have available to us? Um, it, it's all that stuff, yeah, it, it flows together constantly. <laughs> flows together constantly, yes. Can, that's that's coaching. Um, yeah, I, Jan talked about the observer though as in the context of stepping back. So the dictator is where you know you step forward and say it has to be like this, it has to be like this, and um, you said that in games it's not really possible. But I, I was thinking of the timeouts, for example, all the instructions that you can give from the sideline not mm -hmm. the play-by-play -play calling where you know there's there's 10 seconds between the rally there's not a time for a discussion 
uh, you have to commit on this ball or you have to set this player or or whatever. Right. Um, timeouts is a is a similar one. It's you know we're we're restricted to that thirty seconds, uh, one or two instructions, and you know the coach has to speak and uh, and everybody has to listen. Well, unless, the, unless you're Popovich. Uh, well, they have longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> but he also lets the players d- decide what they figure out what they're going to do, right? Well, in in practice, I do as well at <laughs> at, uh, at times, but um, uh, but it's much more difficult in uh, in a younger team or a, a team that's together for only a short period of time because there still needs to be even if the coach isn't being a dictator in that moment, there still, in a sense, has to be a hierarchy of, uh, of imports. Otherwise, the, um, you, know, you end up with a long discussion that goes on forever. And yes. you, have to, you can't have that. You have to reach a final decision in a short period of time. Right, and to John Dunning's point, the, the coach is kind of the arbiter of, of the team culture. So... To a certain degree, the dictate does come down with, at least with regards to certain aspects of how the team plays and how the team acts and and all of that sort of thing. So that there's definitely that kind of active element to it that, as you say, the dictator sort of represents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, yeah, so so Jan's observer was the guy that that steps back and and lets the team practice for a while. Lets the team sort out the problems, let's seize how people respond to different situations without uh, giving giving input. Okay. Necessarily. Right. And uh, and the creator is is uh, making something making something new and um, Jan actually talked quite a bit about differences between uh, between male and, and female uh, volleyball in and he was he was talking that uh, men are much more prepared to experiment so uh, a male coach or sorry a coach of men can be more creative because the the conditions are are there whereas he found it as a coach of women that they were very reluctant. The players are very reluctant to do anything out of the ordinary. To do, uh, we talked a little bit about the anger pet style uh, situations where you know, we're hitting the second ball or f- pretending to hit it or non-setters are setting fast and, and these kinds of things. And and uh, he was saying that he would love it if his uh, if his women's teams would do that, but it was a very difficult thing to get them to do. You know, you did that interview when I was coaching in Sweden, and I automatically mentally pushed back on that because my team was very experimental. They weren't, it wasn't so far as Ingepath, but there are very few teams that are quite so far as that, um, yeah. even, even on the men's side. But I think it was the nature of the players that I had, you know, and it was primarily my three Americans being the much more experienced, but you know, much more accomplished players that mm-hmm. were happy to, to try something out and, and problem solve in different ways. So I, I kind of bristled a little bit when Jan talked about that. Uh, and I, and I think and this kind of, I guess, goes to the dictator side of things a little bit is, is part of, part of it is the environment that you, allow or create within the team, male or female. Because if, yep. if, if Ingepeth was playing in a team where the coach absolutely did not allow him to do those things, then either he's not going to do them or he's going to be sitting on the bench. So there, there has to be that acceptance of the creativity and the, the dynamism that, that goes into it. Um, the one thing I will, I will ground to Jan is that female players do tend to be much more literal when receiving instruction. Than, yeah. than male players. Half, I mean, assuming the male players even listen to what you say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can't make any comment about that. <laughs> um, the other thing I thought of in terms of the whole creative thing is, 
is I'm not surprised that Jan would bring that up because he's he seems to be quite proud of the fact that he is constantly coming up with with new practice plans. I mean, that's yeah. that's his thing. He doesn't want any two practices to be the same. Yeah. Uh, which obviously inherently has to have some level of creativity to to be accomplished. Indeed, it does. Indeed, it does. Uh, and uh, going through the going through the notes for for this one, I also came across uh, something from the Bill Neville interview, um, where he was talking about the roles of the coach and the one great one that he had was that the coach was the servant of the team yeah I, I can't argue with him I mean I've, I've for a long time thought that my position as the as the quote unquote leader of the team it, it, what we are inherently trying to do is develop these these players individually and collectively which which it doesn't mean you're subservient to them, but it definitely means that you're working as a facilitator of that process. You yeah. cannot you cannot dictate that Joe gets better. You cannot dictate that the team plays better. You have to work with them to get that to happen. Yes. Yeah, I uh, I agree, and we can go. We can even on the same uh, the same kind of vein. We can go to the Craig Marshall interview where he talks about the most important thing that the coach has to do is the thing that's required right now. And I think that's a little bit the coach being the servant in the sense that um, the servant is does what's required in the in the moment does what his master uh, asks him to do right uh, and uh, i think that's a, that the idea from craig and and from bill there are uh, similar ideas expressed in a in a different way yeah and unfortunately as as we record this my team last night did not have a good, very good match and contrary to stuff that we've talked about in terms of having fairly limited post-match conversations with the teams just because of the tendency for them to be emotional one way or the other. We did end up having a rather long talk, which yeah. fortunately was not of the emotional nature. There was no yelling or screaming or anything like that. There were a few tears, but that was more just out of personal disappointment over things. Yeah. Uh, but it, part of that conversation was the head coach talking to the team and saying, listen, if there's something wrong, if you don't understand your role in the squad or there's something that needs to be addressed by the coaches, then you need to tell us <laughs> because we can't fix it if we're not aware that there's a problem, um, yep. which, which goes to that. It's a, you know, it's a two way street sort of, sort of idea. Uh -huh. Um, you know the, the the players have to be have to have to they don't I mean okay there's always that that potential issue of, of players thinking of the coach as something less than them in some sort of way esteem sort of way or whatever which I suppose you can get if you have some high ego high profile professional players on huge salaries playing for managers who don't make nearly as much money and who are more likely to get sacked than they are. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at, with the rest of us mere mortals who aren't coaching players like that who aren't in situations like that um, that interaction between player and coach and, and team and coach is really important and sometimes the coach kind of has to force it and, and put the team into a situation where they admit something that you know they, they aren't talking about whether it's in a group situation or whether it's in you know, kind of a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, yep. Because some some players will not bring things up, either because they think the coach knows it or they're just shy. And, you know, neither neither of those helps anybody at all. Uh, with, with some players, it can also be that, maybe especially young players, that uh, they don't think that it should be important. Mm-hmm that 
um, it seems like a peripheral, unimportant issue, and so they don't they don't value it. They they think they should be able to get over it, or or maybe that's older players. It definitely happens. It, well, uh, yeah, I think it can go can go both ways. So, really smart, experienced players know that everything counts for something. Um, that everything has a potential impact. Um, maybe not so smart players or um, even experienced ones uh, are thinking that you know they should be able to, to get over this situation but um, and so therefore don't bring it up with the coach that it's their problem and and it's their responsibility to deal with it yep well and that one of the things that came out of this meeting with us was that at least some of the players were feeling like, what was being said in timeouts was actually adding pressure to them, making them feel more uptight and and questioning the the quality of what they were doing. Um, obviously, that wasn't the intention of the head coach, so this was an interpretation sort of thing based yeah. on what was being said. But it, it was one of those things that, okay, somebody finally said it. Now it can be addressed. Yeah, you know, now we can find a way to correct it. Um, I guess yeah, unfortunately it took most of the season to get to that point. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying this has gone all gone on the whole way, but at least you know, in this situation, the head coach was very accepting and saying, "Hey, we're learning just as much as you are." Yeah, that's that's all part of the process. Coaches don't like saying that, though. <laughs> The, well, I was just about to say the good ones do, but maybe the good ones don't like to say it, but like, but but they do do it. Kind of, uh, kind of goes to your point about in the moment, you you are are firm with your response, right or wrong. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a particular theory of mine. No, I I don't think this is a a theory really, but um, that something that in a game. So anything that you do with conviction is better than anything you do without conviction. So even if the choice is is objectively right or wrong, which can be in either direction, if you carry it out with with full conviction that it's the right answer, um, then then you actually have the the better probability of success than choosing the right option. Well, and, and if afterwards it it turns out to be the wrong choice and you take responsibility for it with the team, they tend to respect you that much more. Uh, that is certainly the theory. <laughs> Are you suggesting that's not necessarily the case in reality? I think a lot of things that you read in in uh, coaching books and coaching uh, theories are, uh, I don't know what the word is, um, they're wishful thinking. Um, and you will read a lot in different coaching books that if you admit your mistakes to the team, then the team respects you more. Um, now, it might be true. It's certainly something that you would want to be true. Um, but again, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure that it is true. I think I think like I think, everything. Yeah, it, I think the amount it's may, be true may, sometimes yeah. and not true other times. Yeah, and I, and I think the frequency at which you're wrong probably plays into that. <laughs> if you're constantly apologizing to the team, there might be a problem. Uh, yeah. The the end of the day, the co the the function of the leader, whatever the leader is, is that the the followers, the, t the team underneath the leader, um, followers is a kind of pejorative term, but okay, the, the, the group that's uh, that's being led <laughs> needs to needs to know that the leader has solutions to their problems. And has their best interests in mind. And has their Yes, those those two things definitely. Right. So if this this way is completely off track now, but 
It's why I don't like coaches that jump up and down on the sideline because those coaches are not giving the the feeling to their team that they have a solution to to the problem that they find themselves in. Come on, you mean you, pass the ball isn't isn't a solution? Uh, no, it's not a solution. <laughs> All right. Uh, Screaming at the referees is not a solution. Yeah. Um, Shouting at a player is not a solution. Right. All right. Um, We're just about out on time here. Any final thoughts? I think the the idea of the role of the coach is is probably something we could we can come back to and have a completely new discussion every every few weeks because. so many coaches, well, coaches are individuals. They all have their slightly different take on it. Every situation is different, requires a slightly different, uh, slightly different role. And depending on the level, you have so many different things that you may or may not have to contend with. So it's a, it's a really interesting discussion that, that can be new every time we have it. Probably so. All right, we'll wrap it there. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.